Uh, title of my message today is called Checklist. The Checklist. If you have your notes, you're going to need them because I'm going to give you nine prerequisites to finding the right person for you. All right? So this is going to be very specific. And we're going to be looking at a very familiar story. It's the, the story of how Isaac found a bride. Okay? So in the book of Genesis, chapter 24, I'm going to read it to you if you don't have your Bible. Uh, you can Google it or share one with your neighbor. I didn't put it on the screen today, but I'm going to read it to you. Starting in verse 1 through 4, listen to the story how Abraham found a bride for his son. It says, Now Abraham was old and well advanced in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham said to, the, to his old servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, which is a little awkward, by the way. Um, I, I don't know why we don't do that anymore, but I'm glad we don't. Um, please put your hand under my thigh, and I'll make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son, from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. Verse 4, But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. All right, so we can pause there real quick. So we've got Daddy Abraham. He's old. He's about 175 years old, so really old. His son is 40 years old, and he's not been married yet. Abraham's like, you know what? It's time to get my boy a girl. And he calls the servant of the house in and he says, come on over here, put your hand under my thigh and, uh, and make a promise with me. I want you to go find a bride for my son, but you're not going to go out from our door and look in the land of Canaan. I want you to go back to our people. I want you to go back to where I came from, from my family, where the promise originated. That's where I want you to go. So the servant understands. They have a little bit of a misunderstanding for the next few verses. But then the servant, he decides, okay, it's time to go. Look at verse 10, and this is what happens. Then the servant took 10 of his master's camels, and he departs. For all his master's goods were in his hand, and then he arose and he went to Mesopotamia, to the city of Nahor. And he made his camels kneel down outside the city, which is a 300-mile journey, by the way, 300 miles. He made his camels kneel outside the city by the city well, a, a water spot at evening time. When the time for women go to draw water. Then he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master Abraham. Behold, here I stand at the well of water and the daughters of men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may take a drink. And she says, drink, and I'll also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this, I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. And it happened before he had finished speaking that behold, Rebekah, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's, Abraham's brother, came out with her pitcher on her shoulder. Now, the young woman was very beautiful to behold, a virgin no man had known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, please let me get a little bit of water from your pitcher. And she said, drink, my Lord. Then she quickly let down her pitcher and gave him a drink. And when she had finished giving him a drink, she said, I will also draw water for all of your camels until they have finished drinking. Then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough ran back to the well to draw water and drew for all of his camels. And the man, wondering at her, remained silent, so as to know whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. We're almost done. So it was, when the camels had finished drinking, that the man took a golden nose ring, weighing half a shekel, and two bracelets for her wrist, weighing ten shekels of gold, and said, Whose daughter are you? Please tell me. Is there room in your father's house for us to lodge? And she said, I am the daughter of Bethuel, Milka's son, whom she bore to Nahor, which is Abraham's brother. Moreover, she said, we have both straw and feed enough and room to lodge. Then the man bowed down his head and worshiped the Lord. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of my master, Abraham, who has not forsaken his mercy and his truth toward my master. As for me being on the way, 
the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. Stopping there. So here's a story that I wanted to put before you today that I think we can draw some really good life lessons from on finding the right person for you. No matter what season you're in or maybe finding the right one for your kids or your grandkids, some lessons here that we can, I I would say, really learn and apply to our situation. You know, the whole idea of love at first sight, you know, Dr. Sue said this, you know, you're in love when you can't fall asleep because reality is finally better than your dreams. I'm not sure about that. Um, Tommy, age five, said this, once I'm done with kindergarten, I'm going to find me a wife. So, all right, Tommy is getting started early. Uh, Lynette said this, it's better for girls to be single, but not for boys because they need someone to clean up after them. Uh, that's a nine-year-old. Uh, John at age nine, he says this, love is like an anvil, uh, I'm sorry, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. Uh, it's like, all right, John at age nine. Um, Camille, age nine, when asked what is the secret to finding love, she said, shake your hips and hope for the best. Like, <laughs> it's like, what? Camille, come on. Um, but definitely uh, a, a strategy that has not failed some. Um, you know you're in love when your homepage on Facebook is your lover's picture. You know you're in love when you stop spending your paycheck on video games, young guys. Um, you know you're in love when you actually start caring about what you wear and you wear deodorant. Uh, you know you're in love when they, you don't mind their quirks. You know you're in love Uh, when you walk the most inconvenient places to see them, uh, anywhere they're at, or you drive by their work, or just go out of your way to see them, all right? You know you're in love. Um, You know you're in love when every single cheesy, pathetic song makes sense all of a sudden, right? Think about all the love songs. You're like, oh, I get it now. Uh, You know you're in love. You know, I remember the very first time I saw my wife, you know, love at first sight. Uh, I was 19. I was going to church. I got invited. I was not a church goer, but I got invited. It was a Wednesday night. And when I showed up, you know, I was not really accustomed to going to to church, like nothing this big anyway. It was a gigantic church and there were tons of people everywhere. And I walk in these doors and it felt like a nightclub, like it, the smoke was going on and there were lights. And I'm just like, what is this? You know? And, and I go walk in and all of these people were in there and they were singing. And there was this girl up on stage that was singing. And I I was like mesmerized as soon as I walked in, like, is that an angel? You know, and uh, I I go and I find my seat near the front row and it it was her. It was my wife. Okay, She was up there singing on stage. And and my buddy that invited me, you know, I was working out in a gym and he he invited me to come to church with him that night. And so I went. Uh, I I remember, you know, leaning over to him like, hey, hey, who was that girl? And he's like, that's the pastor's daughter. You don't want to, you know, don't, don't even think about her. I'm like, oh man, she's gorgeous. Like I'll come to this church any day for that. You know, like, woo. It's like immediately after service, I went and talked to her and she blew me off. You know, I was a pagan dog and she's like, get away from me. Um, but I came back the next week and hoped to see her again. And I heard the gospel for the very first time. And I got right with God. And so looking for a girl, I found God, um, which is amazing. He transcended, amen to that. Let me tell you, there's a bunch of guys that have been led to Jesus because they were chasing a girl, all right? And I'm one of them. So it's okay. So you ladies, you can do your thing, okay? Bring the guys in. I'll preach the gospel. Let's get them saved. Um, (laughs) Maybe not, okay? But um, I remember the first time I saw her, you know, love at first sight. And I thought, man, I want to marry that. I went home and I actually told my parents, I found, I found my future wife tonight. I didn't know anything about her, but there was something that just radiated from her that I wanted. You know, something different than what I I had seen all around me in the world around me. There was something unique, something special, something pure that, that I knew I longed for. When the world offers trash and you see a real thing, it captivates your heart and your soul. And that's, that's what drew me, you know, to my bride, to my wife. I just thought, man, I, I'm going to do whatever it takes to, to, to know her and have a relationship with her. Love at first sight. You know, love is something that every single one of us desire. 
Matter of fact, God put it within us, in our DNA. You know, you think back to the very first love story, and it's Adam and Eve in the garden, which we've been covering the past two weeks. You've got Adam. He is all alone, and God, for the very first time, says no to something. You know, God's been saying, yes, it looks good. It looks amazing. God, for for days on end, had been making his creation. And he says, oh, this is perfect. This looks good. I love it. But then he makes Adam, and he says, no, 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 no. Something's missing. There's, there's a part here that I need to fix. So God says no for the first time in that it's not good for Adam to be alone. And so God fashions a woman, Eve. And he brings her to Adam, and it's love at first sight. Adam looks at her and says, woo, flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Like, this is my girl right here. You know, he, he's in love with her. He is enamored by her. Truly, Eden became a paradise when Eve showed up. Love is, is built within us. We desire to have a significant partner. We, we desire, we long to have someone that would complete us, man with woman. And it's because this is what God intended. God intended for us to be relational people, meaning that you find great significance and meaning and identity in having a significant other. Adam was lacking a part of his identity when God said it was not good for Adam to be alone. I'm going to make him a helper. And for those of you that are married, you know the joy of having a significant other, a teammate, a partner, you know, a, a uh, a partner in crime. You know what I mean? Like you've got your, you've got your, your bestie for the restie right there next to you. And, and that's, that's marriage, the way that God intended it to be. Well, this story in front of us is another love story, but it's a little different because it wasn't Isaac that went and looked for a wife, but it was Abraham who went and got a wife for his son. But what we learn from our story, I think, are some simple truths that will help your quest in finding the right one for you. The first thing I notice this when we go to Genesis chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, if we look at them again, is that Abraham, number one, purposed to honor God from the beginning. He purposed to honor God from the very beginning. Look at verse 1 through 4. Now, Abraham was old, well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to his oldest servant, put your hand under my thigh, and I'm going to make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and earth, that you will not take a wife for my son of the daughters of the Canaanites from whom I dwell. Abraham immediately said, you know what? Listen, we're going to honor God here. It's later in the Bible where we learn that, you know, believers are to be of such that we honor God before anyone and everyone else. Where we have bowed our knee to Jesus Christ and he's our Lord and our master. And we say, God, I'm going to honor you in all of my decisions. And everything that I do, Lord, I'm going to honor you. Abraham was called the friend of God. Abraham walked with God. And here Abraham had a heart for God. And he, he made up his mind, listen, we're going to do it the right way. We're, we're going to honor God in this decision. And in your pursuit of finding a mate, no matter where you're at in life, you need to first start with this. You need a purpose to honor God right where you're at. That you say, listen, God, I'm going to listen to you and I'm not going to listen to the world. You see, there's a difference between the world and the word in front of you. The world around you will tell you that you can do whatever you need to do okay, to find a mate. You can go to whatever dating site you want. You can try whatever ploy and tactic you wish. You know, you can get them by hook or crook, right? You can get these these individuals to stay with you. The, The world's idea of what love is all about, I wouldn't call it love. It's more like lust. You know, sex outside of marriage is uh, it's not love, it's, it's lust. It's, I can't wait to get. It's selfish at heart. But sex inside of marriage, it's, it's selfless. It's love. It's, I can't wait to give. Here we've got a world around us that is saturated with a selfish mentality of, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make myself happy. But you look at the word, and it tells us a completely different story. When me and you get our cues from Scripture, 
and not from Instagram or Facebook or TikTok, I promise you this, you will find it much better in the long run. You know, I have found it to be true that when I listen to God, I save myself from a lot of pain later on. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you disobey, there's a price to pay. Have you found that to be true? Yeah, the times I've not listened to God, I just sit back later and I, I can almost hear God saying like, well, I told you so, you know, I'm thankful he doesn't though. But I can look back and see the times that I disobeyed God. And I go back to the scripture and I realize, man, if I would have just listened the first time, I would have saved myself a lot of regret. I would have saved my heart a lot of pain. Oh, if I would have just listened to the Lord in the beginning. You need a purpose to honor God before you even start looking. Why? Because the enemy is going to tempt you. The world will do its best to trick you. But if you go out purposing to honor God, God, I'm going to honor you in all of my decisions and especially in my choices, I promise you, you will save yourself from a lot of heartache later down the road. So Abraham, he wanted to honor God. He said, listen, we're not going to get a girl from the land of Canaan, but I'm going to send you back home and I want you to go find one from there. The second point this morning is this. What did the servant do? Here's the principle. It's this. Where you look will determine what you find. Where you look will determine what you find. Verse 3 says, you will not get a wife for my son from the daughters of Canaan, but rather you're going to go to my country, to my family, verse 4, and take a wife for my son Isaac. Where you look will determine what you find. And Abraham said, you're not going to look in the trash land of Canaan to find my boy a bride. He wanted the best for his son. And what did verse 10 tell us? His son ultimately ended up with a bride from a specific city. Verse 10, the servant took 10 camels and departed with his master's goods. And he arose and he went to Mesopotamia to the city of Nahor. Nahor is Abraham's brother. Okay, when you've got that many relatives, you can have a city named after you. And that's exactly what this was. We've got Abraham's brother who had a lot of family, had a lot of siblings, a lot of kids. And so they just, when they're sitting back thinking about, hey, what are we going to name this city? Let's name it Nahor. You know, like you've got Montgomery and you've got Prattville and you've got Nahor here. And it's after one man and he's got a lot of, lot of family, a lot of extended relatives. And that's where the servant went. He went to find the right girl for Isaac. The servant knew where to look. It's the same for me and you. Here's a principle I really want you to get. The Bible makes it clear that you should not be entering into a relationship with someone who is not on the same page spiritually as you. Unequally yoked is the the term that we find in the Bible. The Bible makes it clear that you are not to be in a relationship with someone who is not a Christian. If you're a Christian, you're not to be in a relationship with them in any way, whether it's a business deal or even a relationship headed toward marriage. You're not to be yoked with these people, tied together in a relationship with these people, because it will affect you and drag you down. You cannot be a Christian and be romantically interested in someone who is not. Where you look determines what you will find. Abraham told his servant, hey, listen, listen. If you're going to go fishing, I don't want you to fish in this pond. You see, this is a fishing terminology that I really like. When you go fishing, you know, there's two principles. One, the water determines the fish, and the bait determines the bite. The water determines the fish. So uh, coming out to Alabama, like I love fishing. Back in California, I did a lot of like, you know, deep ocean type you know, spear fishing, shooting fish in the face with a gun. And it was awesome. You know, like I loved it. I didn't do too much fresh water, but I moved out here to Alabama and now I'm doing fresh water fishing. And all of these different lakes and rivers and options, they provide you with different types of fish. Okay. But you need to know that if you go to a pond, you're not going to find the same type of fish that you would find in the ocean. Okay. This is like basic knowledge, you know, different types of water, different types of fish. You've got Salt water, fresh water. You've got, you know, shallow lake and deep lake type of fish. Very basic. But then also there's a second thing here. The type of bait you use 
will determine the bite you get. If you like bass, you need a certain type of lure. If you want to catch a catfish, bottom feeder, then you need to use some trash, right? You need to like, you need to put something on that hook that, that you ain't going to touch, uh, but that it'll, it'll munch on it. You know, when I was younger, we lived near a mountain called Big Bear Mountain. And Big Bear Lake was on this mountain. My parents would go up there all during the summer. And so we would go fishing out on the lake. And there were these gigantic carp that would come up and swim next to the, the dock. Now, these carp, I'm sure you know, I mean, nobody's out there eating carp, all right? Like, if you're eating carp, like, that's disgusting, all right? Like, you don't eat carp. Um, Henry calls it a drum fish. Where'd he go? Like Henry calls it a drum. Um, they, we used to feed these carp. Okay. They would bite on anything. So if you just wanted to like, you know, hook something, we would take cigarette butts and put it on the hook and throw it in the water and the carp would bite a cigarette butt, right? Like you're like, Jason, why are you talking about fishing? Because I'm going to tie this around for you in just one second. Okay. Carp will bite on anything, on anything. You feed them trash and they'll bite it. Why does it matter this morning? Because of this. What you fish with will determine what you catch. I wonder if you're reg regretting, don't look at your spouse, but I wonder if you're regretting your decisions because who you've ended up with. Or maybe the past relationships that you've experienced with trash fish, maybe because you were fishing with trash. The type of person you caught is because of the bait you were using. Oh, it's true. Where you look determines what you're going to get. Listen to me. If you're hoping to marry someone who passionately loves Jesus and makes him known, it's probably best to put yourself in a community of people that are committed to that. Let me say it plainly. You will not catch a godly man on Tinder, Match, or Hinge. You will not catch a godly girl at the bar. You will not catch a keeper at the club. You will not catch a keeper in a trash place. A few weeks ago, I had a guy that came in and he was complaining about his girl. And he's like, man, she's, she's been unfaithful to me and she's been running around. She's got a kid with another person. And I just said, well, my man, let me ask you a question. Like, what were you fishing with to catch her? What were you using? He's like, well, I, you know, I went to the club and I met her. I'm so I, I said, listen, you caught a bottom feeder because you, you were fishing with trash. She's a reflection of you, my man. It's your fault. You were fishing in the wrong waters, using the wrong bait, and you caught the wrong fish, and now you're feeling the wake of it. Family, in a positive sense, listen. If you invest in the right place with your life, you say, look, I'm not going to go to the land of Canaan to find myself a bride or a husband. I'm not going to just settle with what's right in front of me. Abraham could have told his servant to go out there to the land of Canaan and find a girl. There were girls everywhere, but Abraham said, no. That ain't going to happen. We're going to go down where, where the promise is at. We're going to go down to where I came from in my family. That's what we're going to do. And we're going to sacrifice this 300 miles. There's going to be a little bit of cost involved. But sacrifice up front pays large dividends later. When you wait and you do it God's way, you don't regret it later. But you make the quick decision and you settle with whoever's right in front of you. And whatever's quick or whatever you find or whatever slides into your DMs, whatever it might be, I'm telling you, you'll have a lot of regret by settling because it's easy. And said, no, I'm going to honor God. And I'm going to start looking for my significant other in a place where, where I would want them to be. Where you look determines what you catch. Birds of a feather flock together, right? If you want to find a godly man, then go to a place where godly men are. If you want to find a godly gal, then go to a place where godly women hang out. Church is a good place to start, all right? That's a great place to start. That's where I met mine, okay? That's where I met mine was at church. She wasn't at a club. She wasn't online, okay? I didn't go find her on the street. I found her worshiping in church, and I have not regretted it. Where you fish determines what you, <laughs> what you catch. Are you guys agreeing with this, by the way? Okay, okay. I don't mean to offend you, but it's true. Thirdly, third principle I see from our story is what this man prayed for. So the servant listens to Abraham. He goes out. He arrives at the city. He's in the right place. But then look what he prays and he looks for. 
because it really matters. The third principle is this. Pray and look for character over charm. Pray and look for character over charm. Okay, look at verse 12 through 14. So he's looking. Okay, imagine for a second. You're the servant, and you're out there, and Abraham just told you to go look for a bride. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? How are you going to get a girl to follow you back all the way 300 miles to marry some guy that she's never seen? That's like the worst online dating ever, right? Like this is married at first sight, okay? Like this is craziness. So he shows up and he's trying to convince some girl, hey, will you come back with me? Because my master has a son and you got to marry him. It's like, what? Are you serious? So look what he does. He determines if I'm going to find the right girl, then I need to pray for the right thing. He says in verse 12 through 14, then he said, oh Lord God, my master Abraham, of my master Abraham, please give me success this day and show kindness to my master. Behold, here I stand at the well of water and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Now let it be that the young woman to whom I say, please let down your pitcher that I may drink. And she says, drink, and I'll also give your camels a drink. Let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant Isaac. And by this I will know that you have shown kindness to my master. What he asks God for is something out of the ordinary. Notice his request. Like, why would he request this? Because it's not normal. He's asking, as a stranger, this is his request to God. God, I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. God, I need you to guide me. How about this, God? A stranger, a girl that's going to be coming to get some water. I'm going to ask her for a drink. And she needs to give me a drink. But not only that, she has to volunteer to give all of my camels a drink as well. Very obscure and very random, but it's revealing something about the girl. There's something going on in that type of girl that she would be willing to to do that. Listen to what that type of girl should be like to give in to that type of request. Number one, she needs to be kind. A stranger asking you for a drink. Hey, let me have a drink of that water you got. You get your own water, fool, right? Like, I mean, honestly, she had to be a kind girl. Okay, no problem. She had to be generous. There is a generous heart that she had. She had to be hospitable. A stranger comes up to you and asks you for maybe a few bucks to get a bite to eat out on the street. That's one thing. But we're talking back in the olden days when she's carrying a five-gallon bucket that she just pulled up on her own that doesn't, you know, weigh a little bit. It weighs a lot. And she's gone out of her way to do all the heavy lifting, and he's just sitting there watching her, and he's now asking her for a drink. And she says, hey, no problem. Go ahead and take a drink. She takes the bucket off of her shoulder and she lowers it down. She says, take, take a drink, take a drink, no problem. But then he's also requested another thing because he's brought a whole entourage with him. He's got some camels with him. His request is that she would not only give him a drink, but give the camels a drink. Let me tell you something about camels, by the way. The bacterian camel can drink up to 30 gallons in three minutes. 30 gallons in three minutes. How many camels did he have? 10, 10 camels. Jesus, yes. Ten camels. We're talking at minimum 300 gallons of water. Five-gallon bucket max that she can hold. It says in the text that she let it down, let him take a drink, but then it goes on saying in verse 20, then she quickly emptied her pitcher into the trough, ran back to the well to draw water, and drew for all of his camels. 300 gallons of water with a five-gallon jug, that's 60 trips. Six, zero trips. What type of woman would be willing to do that to a stranger that she doesn't know? What's in it for her? She doesn't know. She just sees 10 camels with a guy. Let me tell you what type of woman this is. This is one that's selfless, one that's servant-hearted, and one that's hardworking. He was able to narrow down his options by a huge request. And what did he get? He got the exact wife that he knew that Isaac would dream of. She did all of that and more. At the end of her feeding, giving a drink to all of these camels, finally he says, oh my goodness, I've got a gift for you. And he puts out a nose ring, right? Like, I mean, that's not if any of you want a nose ring, but you get a nose ring. 
Uh, maybe a ring would have been better, but he, he hooks her up with a new nose ring. She's blinging from her nose, right? She's got some new jewelry. She's, she's all iced up. And, um, and then he says, hey, can I stay with you? Because i got to talk to you a little bit more. And the story unfolds that it's exactly what God had promised. This is Abraham's brother, and it turns out to be a blessing. And Rebecca is chosen, and she follows the servant all the way back, and she becomes the wife of Isaac. And forever we're, we remember God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who was their son. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you pray and look for charm, I think you will greatly regret it. Today, our culture tells you that charm is more important than character. But what we see with this lady, with Rebecca, is that she had a lot more character than she did charm. Even though she was beautiful, that was just the cherry on the pie. You know, when you find someone that has more character than they do charm, you will not regret it in the long run. You need to ask and pray that God would send you someone that has character, someone that has, you know, weight to them, someone that, that really is, is worthwhile. And that's exactly what this girl was. Listen, the Bible says in Proverbs 31, 30, charm is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she is to be praised. Rebecca was this type of woman. Charm and beauty are just smoke and mirrors. What good is it to have a spouse that looks good but rides around on a broom all day long? Here are some questions. Some of you are just getting it. It's good. I hear like, oh, a witch, right? That's what I'm saying. Uh, she may be charming, but does she have character? She may look sexy, but is she a servant? He may be handsome, but is he a hard worker? He may be ripped, but is he responsible? He can tell a joke, but can he hold down a job? It's time that you start looking for character over charm. Because the years will roll on and gray hair will set in. The body will take a different shape than it originally used to be. <laughs> okay? Things won't work like they started out. But if character is there, if character is there, you'll find a lifelong partner. Focus on the harvest and you're bound to end up with a good helper. He gave her an opportunity and she met that need. These simple principles are the start to where you look. That you honor God. God, I'm going to honor you. Secondly, I'm going to look in the right place. And thirdly, I'm going to look for the right thing. God, I want to honor you. Lord, I'm going to go to the right spot. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to go to those places where godly people are. I'm going to stay away from where the trash fish live. And then I'm going to look for the right thing. I'm not going to be caught off guard by the, the wrong thing, by the smoke and mirrors, by the way that people look or how clever they may be on the outside, but dead on the inside. I'm going to look for the right thing. Now what I want to give you are nine of the right things to look for. I take every person that ever does pre-marriage counseling, which we do a lot of pre-marriage counseling here at Jesus City. I did a lot in California. And this is the checklist that I take people through. And so when I sit down with couples, like, we're going to get married, and we're so excited, and we're in love. And I'm like, really? All right. Let's see if you pass the checklist. I'm going to give you the checklist this morning. It's actually an acronym through the word checklist. And so if you have a pen, I want you to write these down. Some of them are a little different when I sit down with a, a couple, but I'm going to give you the basic of it today. Checklist. The first C, I ask the couple sitting in front of me. And by the way, not only, a lot of people want a perfect spouse, but they don't want to be a perfect spouse. Um, so this list is also something you should be living up to, not just looking for. All right? Again, you catch what you present. If you want to catch a godly girl, then be a godly man. Because a godly girl is not going to bite on trash, right? If you want to catch a godly guy, then you be a godly girl. That's the right bait to use. All right. Andy Minnie, okay? You listen to the right music, all right? Um, that was a Christian song. See, that's a good compliment right there. Um, all right. C for Christian. It's required that you find someone that loves Jesus more than they'll ever love you. 
when I sit down with a couple, I ask them, so tell me about your relationship with the Lord. How long have you been a Christian? Oh, I've been a Christian my whole life. No, 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 you haven't. No, you haven't. No, you haven't. How long have you really known the Lord? Like, take me back to the spot where you knew that he was your Savior. Take me back to the time that you saw him move in your life. You need to ask difficult questions to the person that you're interested in to find out if they're the real deal. Are they wearing the jersey but not on the team? You need to find out, like, that they really know the Lord or not. Do not be fooled. Do you know the Lord? What's your favorite Bible verse? John 3, 16. Wrong, right? Like, no, everybody says that. You know, like, come on. Like, let me see your Bible. Is your Bible marked up? Okay, you, tell me about your church attendance. Tell me about what, where you go. Does your pastor know your name? You know, like, t- tell me, what, what, what do you have to show that Christ has worked and moved in your life? Let me see the fruit coming off the tree. Are they a Christian? Abraham said, we're going back. We're not settling with what's in front of us. Second is the H. H. Look for someone who is honest. Honest. Is the person that you're interested in, are they honest? Do they tell you the truth? You want someone that you can be honest with and someone that will be honest with you. That they'll tell you the truth even when it hurts them or you. Someone that stands on truth. Even in honesty about the past, past mistakes and failings. You know, not too long ago, I did a pre-marriage counseling for this couple. They came in and we got to this spot. And I said, have you guys been honest with each other about the past? And, and he's like, starts sweating these bullets, you know? And I'm like, and I start, you know, leaning in. She's like, oh yeah, he's told me everything. And I know about his life and he's been great. And then I'm like, bro, have you been honest with her? And I said, man, I, I've been waiting to tell you something. I'm like, oh no, what's going to happen right now? And she's like, excuse me? He's like, I've got three kids that you don't know about. <laughs> I was like, what? Like, I'm like, I'm going to flip the table over. This is crazy. This is, are you serious? And she, I mean, she was gone. I mean, she's like, you, what? She literally got up, walked out. She was gone. Like, are you kidding me? Like, you this entire time, you have been, you got, you got three kids from somebody. You, they've been together for like a year and a half. And, and he had just been faking it the whole time. Have you been honest? You need someone that'll be honest with you about past mistakes and past failings. Um, someone that'll tell you the truth. Um, it's hard, but you have to be honest. Um, I can say this. If you've made mistakes and you've got a lot of regrets in the past, still be honest. Um, let them know. Because you want a person that will stay when you're truthful. Someone that will forgive you. Someone that will love you through it. Um, But I can also say this, that if you don't have any regrets, don't start making them. (laughs) Right? Like, don't start making them. Um, If you honor God today, you won't have any regrets tomorrow. Is what I wrote. Honesty, it's very important. E. Are they encouraging? Are they encouraging? You know, this idea of marriage or a partner is that you're building a life together. You're building up a home. You're building up a legacy. And so you need someone that will encourage you. You know, uh, I think it was yesterday, the day before, my wife reminded me that I failed at being an encouragement the other day. And uh, she made this comment. She just said, you know, it's a team. When one person falls, the other person picks them up. And I was just like, ah, oh, you're right. Oh. And I failed. I did not encourage her as I should. I didn't say the kind words, and I didn't uh, step in as a good partner does. You know, when you're looking for the right one, you're wanting someone that, that will be there for you in an encouraging way. You're not wanting someone that will tear you down, use foul language, call you names, or use put-downs. That's the wrong type of person. You're wanting someone that will build you up, not only emotionally, but also spiritually. You need to find a person that will build you up, speak life into you, and say, listen, I love you, and God loves you, and and remind you of what's true. You need someone that will encourage you. Are you encouraging? C, are they coachable? Are they coachable? Not resistant to counsel or correction, 
or advice. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15 says this, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. Proverbs 19, 20 says, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. The Bible says there's safety in a multitude of counselors. Does this person receive counsel? Are they coachable or are they stubborn and hard-hearted? Are they the type that will receive no help whatsoever because they know it all? Listen, you don't want that type of partner. You don't want that type of individual. You want someone that's got a coachable spirit. Someone that says, I'll, I'll receive that. Namely, number one, that they'll be coachable from God. That they'll listen to God and his word. You know, that they pray and ask for help. That they ask God for direction. That they read their Bible and they listen to it. Are they coachable? Do they have a pliable heart in the hand of the Lord? Or are they so obstinate against God that nothing will change them, nor their opinion? Some other people that could pour into their life would be parents, Christian friends, mentors, a counselor, or another pastor, or even you. If you have someone that will not be coachable from you, that's a tough place to be in. I go to my wife quite a bit about things that I need help with or opinions that I need or advice, I go to my wife. Babe, what should I do? Getting her opinion, it's very important. Some of us may have been born wanting to be married, but none of us were born ready to be married. You got to be coachable. You got to be pliable. Is that person coachable? Bring them to church and let's find out. <laughs> right? Um, K, kissing. Kissing. Purity. You need to find someone that has the same moral ground as you do for sexual purity in a relationship. The quickest way to wreck your relationship and be filled with regret is to be physically involved with someone that you're not married to. According to the Bible, any behavior, it got real quiet in here, um, any behavior that is sexual in nature is only meant for the husband and the wife to enjoy. Any. God is not against sex. He invented it. God is for sex between a husband and a wife, period. Any behavior that's sexual in nature should not exist in any type of dating relationship or even a fiance. You're just setting yourself up for pain and heartache. And the Bible says that sin kills. It will destroy your relationship. It will. And it's no shock to me that you look at any of the statistics. This is not just Jason's opinion. Look at the statistics online, by the way. It's like 89% of the couples that live together before marriage get a divorce. It's, like, it's a ridiculous amount. It, it, it blows my mind. We live in a meet-up, hook-up, shack-up, break-up culture. And it's no wonder. It's, you're, you're bound for failure. And the problem is this, is that when you get physically involved with somebody and when you break up with them and you're not married, you experience divorce without ever having to be married. Let me say it again. When you're physically tied to somebody and you break it off, you experience the hurt of divorce without ever even being married because you're doing something only a husband and wife were meant to do. Anything beyond a kiss, I would say, is wrong. Here's a tip. Have boundaries that are established in your heart before you communicate it with your mouth. Find someone that has a similar standard of purity as you. Now, maybe in this room, there's some of you that have already broken this. You've already failed. You've already made a mistake. And you're already like, oh, my goodness, we, Jason, you should have preached on this last week. You know, like, um, if that's the case, listen, if you've already crossed the line, stop today. Repent. Get right with the Lord. Apologize. Commit to the Lord. Jason, we're living together. Move out. Move out and honor the Lord the right way. Make the sacrifice now. You will not regret it later. Honor God and see how he will bless your relationship like never before. You're wondering why there's so much turmoil? Because there's no peace of God. You want the peace of God? Honor God in your relationship. L, we're going to wrap this thing up. L, long-suffering. Long-suffering. Also the word patient or forbearance. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23, it's the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This idea of long-suffering. Jason, why would you say long-suffering? Because, well, in relationships and in marriage, there's suffering, and it's long. Really long. Lifelong. I don't think anybody intends to wound the other person. I don't think it's an intentional suffering, but two sinners under one roof is recipe for a lot of sin. And with sin comes suffering. You will be with someone who will wound you, who will say the wrong things, do the wrong things. They will hurt you, and it will cause suffering. Find a person that deals well with suffering. When you're interested in someone, find out how they deal under pressure. Before you get into a relationship with them, how do they handle difficult situations? It's been said a Christian's like a tea bag. You see what they're made of when you put them in hot water. And it's true. When you put someone in hot water, you find out what they're made of. And before you get into that lifelong relationship with them, how do they handle stress? How do they handle difficulty? Do they have a level head? Or do they panic? Or do they run to a bottle? Do they run to a long night out? How do they handle difficulty and problems? It's important because they'll handle it the same way with you. Find someone who deals well. They suffer well. They trust the Lord. They persevere. They pray to God. They, they, they look to the Lord. Marriage will bring a new type of suffering. But it's okay because two people suffering together is a lot better than suffering on your own. I, integrity. Integrity. Does this person that you are interested in, do they have integrity? Integrity is who you are when the lights are turned off, when no one's around. Do they have integrity? Uh, do they cut corners? Uh, do they respect your lines of purity? Do they keep their word to you? Um, do they remind you of Jesus? Do they have integrity? S, stability. Are they stable? Here's a character trait that is not often talked about or appreciated, but I think it's very important in our day and age. The person that you are interested in, how are they at holding down relationships with people in their life outside of you? Think about this for one moment. How is their relationship with their parents? How is their relationship with other siblings? Look at their friends. Do they have any friends? What are their friends like? How many previous relationships have they had? How long did those relationships last? Tell me about their work history. How many jobs have they had? What's the longest amount of time that they had a job? How consistent are they in their Bible reading? How consistent are they in church attendance? How many churches have they gone to because they didn't like it? Listen, stability is important. If you find a person that this is their situation, oh, you know, I don't talk to my parents anymore because, you know, this and that, and I don't talk to my, my siblings because they're all backstabbers and they want my money, and all of my friends abandoned me, and, you know, I mean, I had this one job, but my boss was just horrible, and so I got this other, you know, then the co-workers, and I got this other job over here. You know, and if you find someone that is unable to hold down any other relationship in their life, they're unstable, they don't know how to do it. It's only a matter of time before they're unstable with you. That instability will transfer into your life. And here's the reason why. Those are people that don't know how to deal with conflict. They don't know how to forgive. And so they're running. It's like the movie Runaway Bride. They don't like their eggs cooked a certain way. You know, they're bouncing around. Here's the issue is that they're afraid of commitment. They're, they're, they've been wounded. They don't want to be wounded. They don't know how to forgive. And so they're constantly on the run. You need to find someone that's stable. A stable person deals with hard situations. They stay at a job a long time even though their boss is a headache because they know it's about character and integrity. They stay in relationships. They don't bounce and run. They don't move away to a different zip code. They, you know what I mean? They stay at a church even when they don't like the pastor or the preaching, my preaching, okay? Like, stay here anyway. Like, honor the Lord. <laughs> you honor the Lord. Are they stable? It's very, very important. If you're unable to hold down any other relationship around you, again, it's only a matter of time before they can't hold it down with you. Finally, lastly, in the checklist, T, time time. How do they manage their time? 
time is the only commodity that you can't get back. You can get more money. You can get more possessions. But you spend your time, and it'll never come back. It's like toothpaste. Once it goes out, it ain't ever going back in. How do they spend their time? How do they invest their time? And then also, how much time have you guys been together before you consider getting married? Just about a month ago, I did pre-marriage for a couple that have known each other. I think it was like two weeks. Two weeks, they're like, oh, we're getting married. I'm like, what? You don't even know each other's shoe size. You know what I mean? Like, what do you mean you're getting married after two weeks? Some couples have made it, you know, like back in like the Great Depression. Uh, you know, we got together after one day and they've still been married. It's amazing. Um, give it time. Time will be your friend in a relationship. You don't need to rush it. Give it time. My wife and I were together a year and eight months before we got married, which is short. That is short, okay? Very short amount of time. I would have done it faster, but her father was like, you will not move any faster. I'm like, okay, okay, we won't. And I'm thankful for that. Time is your friend. You give it time to grow, and you can see what type of fruit will grow on that vine. How do they spend their time? The checklist before you, these are some prerequisites that I think are important to identify the right one for you. To wrap it up and we're done, first, you honor God. Secondly, you know where you're going to look. Thirdly, you know what you're going to look for. And here are nine checklist things that you can check off the list. Okay, they good on that. They good on that. We are not good on that. Okay, then back up, honey. Like, do not put a ring on it. Do not go after it. Don't approach the altar. You guys need to have some serious conversations. The checklist is for anyone to look up to or live up to. For those of you that are married, strive to be the best spouse that you can be. The next two weeks, we're going to be talking about marriage. We're going to talk about what does it mean to be a godly husband, and then what does it mean to be a godly wife, all right? So I'll be going after both of you. Marriage is a lifelong commitment that we should be prepared for. So was this helpful? Yeah? Okay, okay. All righty. Well, let me close in a word of prayer, and uh, we'll end this. Lord, we thank you for this morning. God, I'm thankful just for your word and the, the testimony that we get from these different individuals that have gone before us. Lord, it's amazing to see just what Abraham did in order to bring a bride for his son. He wanted to honor you. He didn't compromise. He knew where to look. They went after the right thing. Lord, I pray for some of the the people in here that are in the single years or the dating time. Lord, I pray that you would give them discernment and that you would help them see, Lord, the right person for them to marry. God, I pray that you would help us not give in to the world, but that we would follow the word. And Lord, I pray if there's any couples in here that need to repent and get right with you, God, I pray you convict their heart. I pray you'd give them your spirit and help them be obedient, Lord, to do what is right. But Lord, I'm also thinking there's some people in here that have a heavy heart because of the failures that they've made. I pray, God, that you would remind them that you love them, that you sent your son to die for them, and that there's amazing forgiveness with you. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for washing away our sin. Thank you for giving us the ability to have a new start. The reset button hit. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, I thank you for everyone here, and I just pray that you would be with them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.